Sorry. <laughs> I couldn't undo once I saw you were just at okay. Thank you. 
accessible as can be. We've been listening to what people have to say about how the place feels. I just learned how to turn the heat on last week. So I'm in the same place as all of you. Um, and we're working on uh, some acoustic treatments to make it a little less echoey in here. Um, that's in the works. It's happening right now. And hopefully each time you come in, this will be a more comfortable and happier place to be. And I also want to thank all of you for tuning in. Uh, uh, online on Fishtrap at Fishtrap.org, on Fishtrap's YouTube channel, and on Fishtrap's uh, Facebook page. Yeah, yeah, thanks for being here. Uh, okay, um, uh, let's get going. Here's how Fishtrap Firetime works. For those of you who have not attended one of these before, or it's been a little while, each month we feature three local Lao County writers to read and share their work to get a bit. Ten minutes to do whatever they want. Take chances. Uh, be artists. And uh, each month we get a little look on what people are writing about and thinking and writing down and thinking about here. Um, I'm really excited. This month we have a special guest, Fish Traps uh, uh, Fall Writer in Residence, Eliza Birnbaum, who is sitting over here, um, who has been um, uh, hanging out at the Kokanee Inn and also. Um, uh, teaching in the local schools at Joseph and Alternative School and Wallawa and more to come, correct? Maybe you can tell us a little about that. Uh, she taught a little writing workshop right here uh, last night and it was a blast. Uh, it was really fun to have Liza here. So um, let's get going with Fish Trap Fireside, November 2022. Liza Birnbaum is this chap's fall writer in residence. Over the past few weeks, she's been all over the place, like I told you about. Uh, Liza holds an MFA in fiction from the University of Massachusetts and a BA in written arts from Bard College. Liza's writing has appeared in Web Conjunctions, Tammy, Open Letters Monthly, and other publications. She lives in Seattle, we all love that place, where she runs a year long workshop for prose writers and teaches at Hugo House, one of our sister organizations. Bard's College Language and Thinking Program, and this is cool, the Washington Correction Center for Women through the Freedom Education Project Puget Sound. She's also hard at work on a book of literary criticism and a novel. Please welcome Liza Minmo. dramatic accompaniment to the reading. Um, but yeah, I'm Lisa, and I'm here for a month as a part of Fish Traps Writer in Residence Program. Um, and I want to say thanks to Fish Traps and to Shannon and Nick and everyone in the organization who's made me feel so welcome. And also thanks to everybody here for coming out. I see some familiar to me faces from the last few weeks, some new faces, and I'm just really grateful to get to spend a month here. It's a really beautiful spot. And with the students and also working with the folks who came for the workshop last night has been a true joy. So I am really happy to be here. Um, I have been, as Mike said, working on a novel. That's what I've primarily been doing while I have been here. But it's very messy. It's in a notebook, not even on a computer yet. So I'm going to read a few pages of another project. And the thing I've been working on here is about two women on a bike trip. And what I'm going to read now is about one woman on a road trip, so you can kind of tell maybe that I have a love of those in transit. Um, so this is from a, a longer piece of fiction called Redbird Most. And I think all you need to know for this excerpt to make some sense at least is that the main character, whose name is Lee, is on a cross-country road trip, as I said, she started in the Hudson Valley. And the trip was sort of precipitated by a uh, death of a 
close friend who's called W. And in this section that I'm going to read from, she's left her friend Hal's house. Hal lives in Wyoming, and she's on her way to Portland to visit another friend. And this starts in the Lolo Forest in Montana, which maybe some of y'all know a little bit. And it is morning. The air is damp and bitter, surprising for summer. She can see the black and blue of crows and jays around her in the trees, but there is no sky, just all the gathered fog. In two sweaters, she stands and boils water for her coffee. She cannot imagine how she got to sleep. What she remembers is staring through the mesh of her tent into the sky, silver black from a sliver moon. Her cup sits steaming, and she turns on the camping stove again. She burns the box that held the crackers she finished in the car, lighting its corner and tossing it into the fire pit. She tears out the letter to Hal and burns that too. Back at the car, she takes out the Walt Whitman poem, looks at it, considers it setting it aflame. But no, she will keep that. No true fire, just the scrunched pages twisting ugly into ash in the center of a circle of stones. She sits then, drinks her coffee, and listens to harsh bird calls fall down from all the trees. The poem sits on the table, pinned under a can of stove fuel. Why are there men and women that while they are nigh me, the sunlight expands my blood? Why, when they leave me, do my tenants of joy sink flat and lank? On the way out of Montana, she stops for more coffee at a place where 50,000 silver dollars stand gleaming on the walls of an attached saloon. It is a cafe and gift shop, bar and unsung tourist attraction, extravagant unifying themes for these places easier to come by in the West, it seems. She stands for a moment and lets the coins wink at her, rows of full moons in the half light of a bar at morning. She likes the look of them. In the gift shop, she buys Lydia a small carved tortoise, cheap trinket, probably made abroad. But she will see her tonight in Portland, and Lee finds choosing a present a pleasant small distraction, a decision that matters less than the choice just to decide. The car ascends into Idaho, then down towards Coeur d'Alene. The lake startles her, an ocean in the middle of the mountain, its far shores not visible. The sun has cut through the fog she woke in, and now it sends its shine off the surface of the water, boats specks in the basin of hills. Idaho does not take long to drive through on this northern route, and soon she is in Spokane and out of it, now in the plains of eastern Washington, curving southwest with the highway. Today, as she drives, she cannot stop hearing her conversations from the days around W's death. She feels the futurity of language in her body, spoken by some voice that is and isn't hers. W died, W died, my friend. What stays are the words, the veiled flat gray of the sky and river. She passes into Oregon, and after a curve west and some long yellow vantages of plains, she sees again the river she has crossed at the state line, the Columbia. It's set in a valley with the river in the east, but this one is narrower, steep-sided, a gorge, not so much a valley, newer, rawer, deeply chiseled. The plains slope up into hills, and the land turns green as she drives west, listening to college radio. The light falls through spread clouds and gilds their edges. Wow, she says to herself, unthinking. And the noise of her voice against the static and chiming guitars of some song embarrasses, then pleases her. The hills rise. Red rock like the clinker Hal has pointed out in Wyoming tops some of them. Though as she drives, the rock she sees is more and more gray-green, touched by the colors of the foliage around it. The river stretches out. Big birds sit in the tops of evergreen trees, and she begins to see waterfalls like threads on both sides of the gorge walls, furling out silver against the green. Wow, wow, wow. This word stays too, soft like a pulse 
as she keeps looking. On the route she takes, there are other things to see too, less lovely. The worst are mostly kept off major roads, whether by chance or by intention. Surface mines and quarries, clear-cut stands of trees. The rivers she knows and revels in carry who knows what contaminants. Runoff from cities, runoff from power plants and tailings and excavations. The settled particulate smoke of the refineries that pepper plains towns. The butte mine and its phantasmagoric colors. Fields and fields of oil derricks dipping smooth and syncopated into the earth. She has not known to look for these things, but they are there. Wounds and blemishes, extractions. South in Colorado, where she has not gone, there are copper mines and mountain caves, all hollowed out. W had seen and hated them. Later, she might see this all more sharply, wonder at it, and grieve. Even her own river is sullied enough that when she tells people she swam in it, they reel in horror. That river is disgusting. I read there was this story on the radio. You don't even want to know what's in it. She's heard all that before, but she will look serious and nod. Yes, but still it was my river, and I was in it as often as I could be. On this drive, though, she has not seen the land as intact or altered, ruined or reshaped. It's simply there, land lasting longer than any life, there in the windshield, the windows, the mirrors around her, indifferent and slanting towards, slanting away. Shape and color, whether torn or touched by nothing, strange but piercing beauty of it, all set into motion. Thanks. Speaking of that, uh, after our first three featured readers, uh, we'll take a break and we'll get to visit for a little bit, fill your cup, uh, get to know the new fish trap place a little bit, and then uh, afterwards we'll have a little open mic se se session. Uh, there are five open mic spots of up to five minutes, so if you've been thinking about something or scribbling something down or want to share something that you wrote or, or somebody else did, I think there are three spots left on the, on the spot over there. Um, so go ahead and sign up afterwards and uh, that'll be a great time. Uh, this next little thing I want to tell you about is especially important for all you folks watching online and in and, and here. There are some exciting things coming up this month and are happening right now. We have opened up applications for the 2023 Summer Fish Trap Fellowships. So if you know an emerging writer who would bloom with the Summer Fish Trap experience, we're accepting applications right now. You can go to fishtrap.org and, and apply. Um, that includes like a full meal deal, a full ride to Summer Fish Trap, and it's a pretty amazing thing. Uh, there are a lot of uh, writers that you know who have been Fish Trap Fellows over the last 30 years. Five years. We also have opened up applications for our year-long writers workshop. If you know a few or you know somebody who said, oh, I've been working on this thing, if I only had the time to finish it, I could finish my novel. Or I have this great idea, I want to write the story of my grandmother, and I, I can just have the, the, the excuse to do it. Well, our year-long writers workshop is that chance to give yourself the gift of a year to write something. Uh, we're accepting applications for the 2023-2024, and it's led by one of our favorite people, um, Perrin Kearns. Um, uh, she's wonderful. You can learn about that at fishtrap.org. One last thing, and we'll get to our next writer. Uh, uh, we, um, we have a couple writing workshops coming up this month. One is in person, and one is online. So uh, if you want to come here and hang out with Cam Scott for a couple hours on November 19th, he is leading a two-hour workshop on Saturday, November 19th, right here from 10 to 2, um, called Those Certain Slants of Life. It's just a, it's, I think it's just a workshop on talking about the change of the seasons, so it doesn't matter what kind of writing you do, um, it's just an opportunity to be inspired and have 
the opportunity to do that. And the other is online. It's November it's next Saturday, November 12th. It's uh, with Amy Minato, who is also an old fish trap friend. She's teaching a two-hour online workshop about memorials, about memorializing somebody important in your life. Um, you can check that out at fishtrap.org. Or if you're here and want to sign up for it, see me at the break and we'll get you registered. Okay. Um, next, our second reader is... Um, Dustin Lyons. Uh, it was in a small, defunct timber town in southwest Washington where Dustin Lyons was raised that he developed an unshakable case of posy. This eventually led his big shaggy head full of words and affected insight to the English Literature Department at the University of Washington. Graduation came and with it a desire to see the world and get back to the mountains. A decade of seasonal work in Alaska, along with forays into Asia, Latin America, and Europe produced piles of journals chock full of nearly uninterpretable masterworks. <laughs> Maybe some other people here can. <laughs> um, in response to these literary triumphs, he decided to shift gears and study shoemaking in Ashland, Oregon, where he co-founded Elka Hess Leather. I'm wearing a pair right now. Eventually, a lifelong affinity for critters and wild places drew him to the base of Chief Joseph Mountain, where he owns a tumble-down cabin on a couple of uncombed acres. The words keep coming, and he does his best to intelligibly lay them down. Please welcome Dustin Lyons. So much in a name. At first breath, some of us are saddled with Moses, a prophet, or Sonny, a desirable weather outcome. With all that innocence and potential writhing under the wall-eyed gaze of pure love, parents tend to overlook the chance that they may be adding unfortunate pressure to the lives of their toe-headed victors and bright little chastities. Perhaps Arnica, at age 40, ends up with chronic back pain that even opiates can't touch. <laughs> and Hope, well, she struggles to pay rent for the cost of pills and counseling. Did you hear about the Lovejoys? Yeah, they're getting their divorce. <laughs> Herman ran off with her brother. I suppose I'm lucky that the Entendre twins have always kept me doubled over. Those are buds. And that my parents named me after a menial chore. Dustin. <laughs> Given that the Jeroen is left incomplete, I have only to live up to a cool and cursory attempt at housekeeping. As I sit here at my writing desk, strewn with scribbled notes and cat hair, and stare down at what I'm wearing, leather debris and trail dirt on frayed dungarees and an old shirt, I feel somewhat satisfied that I fulfilled this part of my mission here. A slapdash dude named Dustin. <clears throat> Dustin Lynn Lyons. That is the full name of this waterlogged continuation I call me. How does it bear on the salmon stream of this life that I'm attempting to run? What does it mean? Where does it come from? My parents don't recall exactly why they named me Dustin, other than that a certain Mr. Hoffman was a big deal on the big screen at the time. <laughs> And they figured their yet in utero, accidental son deserved some measure of celebrity, however meritless. Perhaps many, most, or all people sit with the phonetics of their name at some point in their lives. It's a strangely amusing thing to think about the actual punctuated sounds that leap from another's mouth to get your singular attention. Dust in. Dustin. That's me. So I'm told. It didn't become a common name in the United States until the late 70s and into the 80s. But it doesn't have the biblical ubiquity of a John or David. There is no one I'm close to who shares my given name. It's of Norse origins, apparently. Perhaps an onomatopoetic rendering of some piece of Thor's stone that came tumbling down on the heads of the worshipful. Whatever the case, it traveled to France on the blade of a Viking battle axe as Torsten, brave warrior. 
then invaded England with the Normans as Tuscan, jilted the T in favor of D, marauded the shores of the New World, and continued its bloody march to St. Peter's Hospital in Olympia, Washington, where on March the 13th, in the year of our Lord, 1978, this brave warrior filled his lungs with that first breath of medical air. Quite unaware of the tantalization, confusion, love, torment, poetry, laughter, and sorrow that would follow life's unappealable conscription. <clears throat> Pools, ponds, lakes, and waterfalls. I know not how I could move through life's ineluctable travails without the company of the most untamed and lonely of these terrestrial waterworks. I suppose it's apt, then, that my middle name is Lynn, Celtic for the clamoring shoots of spring and the croaking tarns of fall. Lynn is the spa that adds a note of distinction, perhaps a certain thermal appeal, to my meeting of monikers. I got it from my dad, this lyrical link of a name, this waggish grain, this taste for the trail, the surfs and swales, the deadfall and meadow blue of the backcountry. Central in the nostalgia of my desperate need for coherency, there's this child recollection of my brother and I in the Goat Rocks wilderness, rollicking back to camp with rainbows strung on buck knives willow boughs. I turned to see my father walking along Goat Creek, a flagpole in hand, peering off into the flawless distance. <clears throat> On his whiskered face, rising like bird flesh, a broad, childlike grin, the kind that settles all distress and death. I've spent much time picking my way through the fruited briars and mosquito marshes of all that's happened since that moment crashed into the plunge pool of memory. Like the skunk cabbage and lily pads on Papa's palm, or my mother's smile, soothing as the afternoon sun over Mayfield Lake, or that jadeite pool on the North Salmon, where I stripped naked and proposed from a rendered bed of marble. Water tethers the summits to the sea. It finds the weak spots and flushes them out deepens the cuts as it cleans them, sinuates the ride, feeds and freshens and mills the dams in the sand. My father and his father, Papa we called him, took a trip to the old world when I was a teenager. Of the things they found there, one was the Lions family crest in Cork County, Ireland draped in a festoon of heraldic leaves. There's the brave warrior in plate armor, rising above a chevron flanked by three African lions. That's right, the fiercest of African predators graces the coat of arms of my tasty, whiskey-swilling forebears. I come from a long line of unapologetic Bonham appropriators. <laughs> That's my high school mascot for fighting pangolins. We get ball. Further illustrates. The eldest lions my dad has any information on is my great great grandfather, Frank, whose father, or perhaps whose grandfather, crossed ye old salt chuck from County Cork to the New World in search of earlier smiles. Ironically, we know little about Frank, other than that he grew up in Maine and his father was a dentist who very much wanted to pass his passion for periodontal probing on to his son. It was not to be. Frank preferred the life of a gandy dancer on the railroad, and then a cavalry man in the army, and then a factory worker in Lake Oswego, Kansas, where he met my great-great-grandmother, Mom. Frank Lyons, the eventual farmer, would have a stroke, pitchfork still in hand, and freeze to death next to a haystack at the age of 67. But not before his son, Bill, made his own way as a Dust Bowl farmer near Callaway, Nebraska. At some point, busting sod and watching livestock die of starvation in the drought-wracked, 
rattlesnake infested Midwest of the late 1930s. Became too much for Bill, his wife Maggie, and their 11 children. So in 1940, they followed the call of the plow and the saw out west to Onalaska, Washington. My grandfather, Bob Lyons, son of Bill, like his beautiful and talented wife, Elvina, my nana, and like so many of us, was a deeply flawed individual with a bottomless capacity for love. From the pyroclastic flows of St. Helens to his final words to me at the Franceschian Hospice House, I won't see you for a very long time. That honorary, lecturing, hard-nosed leg cord saw me through the romp and wreckage of youth. I wear my trucker hat askew. I wring my hands in the final minutes of the ball game. And sometimes I catch myself crooking my mouth sideways to the right when I'm bullshitting. Quite naturally, just as you do. Lions are a prideful, clannish bunch. A particularly prominent family in southwest Washington County where I cut my teeth, picking berries and bucking hay, kicking cow pies and contemplating those first forks along the trail from adolescence. To get to this medial moment in my life, with my heart and values yet intact, I've needed every bit of the grit and humor I gleaned from my forebears. And I've had to further devise some of my own. It's so damn easy to dwell on and in one's failures, burning everything that's been gained just to keep from freezing. Fed by romance and melancholy, the solitary cave cat is a character that in bouts I have an innate tendency to play, but never for too very long. Life is most freely and brightly lived in a pride of the ones we trust. There is so much in the name. It gives story to origin and headline to headstone. It opens some doors and closes others. In its betrayal of anonymity, it can feel detaining. But as a mark of selfhood, it can also act as an essential nudge toward conscience, to a personalized regard for the big picture and one's responsibility within it. Like a genetic thing, names can trap us in the flame of fate. Or they can give grounding to the voltaic, inspiration and commitment to course, an X on the map, something to solve for. Mine is a name that has 44 years of history, a credit record, a place that holds Ski Run Road and on South Korea's watch list for degenerate Westerners. <laughs> <laughs> Coaxed along by the breath of its bearer, each name has a certain look, a feel, a ring to it. Dustin Lynn Lyons, a threadbare flag of egoism, and a sand scrawl of common characters content to vanish on the tide. I look at my written name and it compels a reflection on the life I've lived, on the one I'm currently waking and working for, playing at, habitually testing. It's a standoff over the charging waters of time between Dustin, that imaginative, fluid boy, armored into man, and the line of all he's yet to face, all he strives to live up to, all that ripe, honest, fundamental defeat, annealing the heart and tragedy, and composing the mind and humor. I can think of no clearer and meaningful expression of love Sorry, I can think of no clearer and meaningful expression of respect than love. To be recalled with the depth of that affection and by name for the short time that we can reasonably expect to be recalled at all. Well, is there any aim richer in honor and reward? At this point, there are but few things I care to know too much about. Who am I? Who are you? And what in the devil's loose deuce is actually going on here? <laughs> Let's start with names. <laughs>
And November is National Write a Novel in a Month. National Novel Writing NaNoWriMo. <laughs> yeah. Uh, although Bootstrap doesn't have any, uh, this is a long standing international program where brave souls, like I was talking about before with the, uh, the year long writing workshop, um, this is a program that goes on all around the world. It's like they dare people to write a novel in a month. And that doesn't let you do any internal editing. You just have to write and write and write and write. It's about generating, generating work. Uh, Fishtrap isn't doing any uh, official programming with it, but we're inviting our next, our next reader has invited, um, is inviting folks to meet here, to be involved and to meet here on Sundays this month from I'll let Kirsten Paul talk, talk about it for a second, to give it a shot. Uh, might as well. Uh, so if you've ever thought of being brave and fearless and trying to write 5,000 words in a month, uh, don't remember where we're going. Okay. I'm so happy to have our next reader here. Kirsten Rolla has been around the periphery of Fish Trap for a long time, volunteering at Summer Fish Trap, obviously working with us with the big read every year, and kind of peeking in the doors. Um, but this uh, last summer, uh, Kristen signed up for Summer Fish Trap, and just became such an important part of the week, just by being a part of the conversation and being in the And so as soon as it was over, I went, well, Want to read Fireside? <laughs> and um, thank you for agreeing to do that. So uh, Kristen Rolla lives in Joseph and has been writing her whole life. She is an enthusiastic lifelong learner, loves a relaxing day on the lake, and works hard to keep her dog in the good life. She has also earned a BA in creative writing and secondary education and a master's in curriculum and instruction, an editing certificate, and has taught literature and writing for 15 years for the first time at, at uh, Fish Trap Fireside. Welcome, Kristen Roll. Thank you so much. I am so excited to be here. So just a real quick, uh, Nano Rhino, 50,000 words in 30 days. That is technically a novella, but who's really counting except all of us were counting. That's sort of the point of this. Um, I would be really excited if any of you are thinking, hey, I would like to write anything. It doesn't have to be a novel. It doesn't even have to be like fiction. You can come write poetry. You can write nonfiction. You can write a short story. If you want to come hang out on Sundays this month from like 1 to 3, bring a snack, bring your like not adult beverage of choice, like coffee or tea is great. Um, we're just going to hang out back here and do some writing. Sometimes just that body doubling of someone else in the room being like, oh, okay, they're writing, I'm going to write too. And then we can like share some lines that we do. It's going to be really cool. So if you would like to come and hang out, come and hang out. So that being said, feel free to ask questions after this. I'm going to go ahead and get into my reading. Um, I have three different pieces that I will be reading tonight in hopefully different styles so that you stay really interested. The first two are some flash fiction fantasy pieces um, that are connected to the novel that I wrote last year for NaNoWriMo. Um, and then the last piece is a poem, a prosatry prose style pro poem. Uh, which I learned how to do at the Summer Fish Trap with Ellen Waterston. And shout out, if you are online, Alex Ortega, the flash fiction workshop that I took with him in October. Super cool. So my first two pieces were kind of linked with that, that I linked to my novel that, you know, life is all linked together. So here we go. The first one is Family, a reverse chronology. I've been thinking about generations, your theme, for like a month, and it's just totally messed with my head, so... Sorry. <laughs> Family, a reverse chronology. Three, Karabakri walked tall in the world, despite the inauspicious beginnings of being left to die in the woods as an infant. She liked being a blank slate, no weight of tradition holding her back. Her first future, she thought, was not worth dwelling on. There was a reason that she was now on the path to her second future, one like the memories of her parents fighting for her right to enter their ancestral village with a child not born of their blood. Memories of her parents, 
holding her so tight, she forgot the whispered words in her ear, commentary from children and adults alike, questioning her very right to exist. Memories of her parents' traditions, a name that should have been reserved for the sibling she never had. A culture supplemented with secrets so hidden they had gone to the very depths of the world to find anyone who could teach their child her heart language. She had never doubted the love of her parents who took a chance on a basket baby in the woods. Two, Slovakri <coughs> and Kalyans were young, and they were not looking for a baby when they decided to take a shortcut through a section of the dark wood. Nevertheless, they were not surprised when they found one. Perhaps she had been left to the wo wolves. Perhaps she was intended to perish in the coming storm. The clean face and the tight swaddling suggested otherwise. The couple was on their way north after a long journey to the far coast and had only a few weeks until they hunkered down for winter and spent months analyzing the research. They gathered. The village they wintered in was in the high north and closed tight to outsiders. I had a dream, Slovakri said, and Kalyant nodded. He rummaged through their bags to find a suitable offering to leave at the base of the tree, while Lavakri wrapped the child tightly to her chest. They were already far away. One, Arabim heard the soft knock on her door and knew what she would find there before she ever opened it. She didn't need to look in her crystal. This was the way of things in her dark woods. The baby was swaddled snugly in a soft blanket and tucked in a woven basket. The design threaded through the sides was easy to identify, but it didn't matter to Aragon. Within a week, the basket would be sold and a new, plain one bought. The child was perhaps four months old, her skin a pale pink, the color of the first sunset but it would no doubt darken up age. That wasn't what landed the foundling on the doorstep of a witch. It was a tiny mouse just starting to form behind her hairline. Her parents, or one of them anyway, had probably checked for signs of origin every day since birth, then nearly on the edge of relief. But now, in another month, the nubs would be impossible to hide. Regardless, the child was taken in and cooed to, tended and coddled for weeks upon weeks, much longer than it usually took Erdem to find the right match. It was an obsession at first, checking the crystal five times a day, asking the spirits whether this traveler or that would be the home she sought. By the end of the month, she began to let herself think that this child might not have a place outside this very home, that she, Erdem, might finally raise a replacement. At long last, though, two months on, the crystal showed her the picture of a young couple, strangers to the region, but familiar with secrets a dark wood could hold. Awesome. The second piece is a letter to Karavakri. To whom it may concern, what I write to you, I know you will believe, because I know you know how much I hate to admit what comes next, past the part where it is implied that I don't let you be kept, <laughs> sorry, past the part where it is implied that I don't like you, which I don't, past the part where I think you are stuck up and ridiculous, because you are, past the part where I think your air of not caring what others think is to hide the pain and shame of being demon spawn. Let's get past that, shall we? You are right. I hate that you are right more than I hate the implication of what it means that you are right. Magic is in crisis. What can we be if there is no magic by the end of the next few generations? The fools in the villages who think that because they don't have magic, they are better than us, work harder than us, are more natural than us, they will win, and I will look past you to get to them, because I cannot let them win. Insufferable, ignorant mass. They will put you and I in the same category, and hate us equally, and I hate that you taint me with the infection. 
connection of your birth, and so I will help you restore, restore the balance. As you ask, do not thank me. You will not enjoy my company on the journey we must take. To be honest, I might not even mind the end of magic, for I will be long dead by the time it happens. But Grendlin will be irate, and you know how spirit guides are. I could ignore her for the rest of my life if I had to, but my master Corbin also insists. He does not fully believe your story or mine, but on the slim chance it is true, he says he cannot risk doing nothing. He says it will be a good education for me to go out in the world after these few years of seclusion and study. You know how I hate people. Well, you may ask why the change of mind. I will tell you, and that will explain the profound anger I have at being wrong. The truth is, I set out to prove you wrong. I tallied the stars every night for three months. I sent and received letters from every sentient dragon I could find on the entire continent. I ate the fruit of the forbidden Cirsten tree and dreamed the forbidden dreams of the past. The first two things you could have done yourself, and that may have helped your case when you came begging months ago. Allow me to gloat that the last you could not have done yourself if you valued the pitiful life you lead. Perhaps if you had tried, you could have joined my ancestors in the dream world instead of your own in the nine hells. The results have been the same. There's a rift growing between our realm and the sky realm. The dragons are not repopulating. I have seen the death of the ancient Cuesta, thought to be alive these past hundred years. Her body has not ascended, as you had hoped it had not. So now I will come to you, and we shall restore the balance of magic with your ragtag cult of adventurers. Lovingly, your cousin, Guashitari. <laughs> I am made from boats, a steam engine here, a port window there. It is no wonder I am safe at the ocean, the lull of waves calming my, my over-agitated mind until I remember what's important, a sense of adventure, learning new things. Consider the debate over epigenetics and chemical pay, which suggests DNA, DNA memory of trauma passed down from our ancestors. I like to think the good gets passed along too, because the thing is, no one gets on a ship in 1906, or 1856, or 1620, and stays in the steerage quarters if they don't think the life they are going to Will be, the, will be better than the one they're leaving behind. But maybe Hatsu and Maria found a little comfort here and there, in a sway of water, beneath the plank, beneath their feet. Did they have a lighthouse in their hearts to guide them to a home they had never seen, traveling with parents, siblings, a spouse and an infant, first in a line of ten? A guiding light would be nice traveling alone to join the husband you've never met. I don't know if they follow their hearts or a sense of pragmatism. Is it any wonder then I sit on the edge of an ocean and wonder if I too should go? What shore will take me in and grow a new generation filled with the names of the previous so I don't forget my roots when my legs are unsteady? Maybe I'll take the next ship to Venus or the moon, and someday when the farm is planted, I'll send for you so you can ride the atmospheric waves and create memories in your cells of the gentle thrum of an engine and the imperceptible sway of a ship floating through space. Thank you.
Thanks to all of you folks who tuned in online. I really appreciate it. And most of all, all you folks who braved the weather to come down here. I hope you had a great time and it filled you up. If you felt like this might have been even a better time flipping something on Netflix or something. Uh, there's a little uh, donation bowl in the back you can throw, throw a couple bucks in that helps us pay for snacks and stuff. So we're going to take a little break, visit with everybody, get to know um, our writers, get, uh, get a snack, and we'll come back with an open mic in about